Jaime Munguia retains his WBO World Super Welterweight title with a controversial 12-round majority decision over Dennis Hogan. Now, this was a hotly contested fight, highly competitive throughout, fought at a frenetic pace from start to finish. In the first couple rounds, Munguia came out looking like he wanted to box, but he quickly abandoned that because he realized that Hogan had planned to stick and move. And when I mean stick and move, I, I, I'm putting the emphasis on the move, all right? Hogan was moving all over the damn place. Uh, incredible fitness levels by both guys, but particularly Hogan to be keeping up the level of movement that he kept up. It's only really in the final few rounds uh, where Hogan started to slow down. His legs noticeably slowed down and he was coming in and clinching a bit more. And ironically, when Hogan started to slow down, for me, that's when he was landing his best punches because he, he was forced to exchange more uh, with Jaime Munguia and he was getting the better of the exchanges in the final third of the fight. But for the first two thirds of this fight, I found it difficult to split him. I felt like it was nip and tuck, uh, back and forth. Munguia would take one round and Hogan would take one round. Munguia would take another, Hogan would take another. And these were mainly close rounds. You know, these were rounds who, where you could have gone one way or the other. So you could have had very, very different scorecards, in my opinion, through the first half or first two thirds of the fight. You know, depending on what you like. Munguia was obviously a lot more aggressive. Uh, Hogan was moving and landing some nice uh, counters on the way in. But there were rounds there where I just felt like Hogan was being outworked and he wasn't throwing quite enough. And he was relying on just, you know, a few clean counters and that was maybe being overruled by Mungia's constant pressure because, as I say, Mungia attempted to box first couple rounds, realized this ain't going to work. Let me just revert to type, which is to charge forward, relentless pressure, high work rate. So that's what he ended up doing for the remainder of the fight. Now, I had it, I think, even after eight, so I was really struggling to split them. But in the final third of the fight, for me, that's where Paul Hogan pulled away. As I mentioned earlier, he started landing the cleaner shots. He started exchanging because his legs were getting tired. Uh, and he was forced to exchange with Munguia, but his punches were shorter and straighter than Munguia's were. Munguia was winging these wide shots, uh, which weren't landing, at least in the final third of the fight, as well as Hogan's were landing. So... At the end of the fight, I tallied up my scorecard. I did score it. I didn't watch this live. I watched it the day after on uh, Daily Motion. And my scorecard was 116 to 113 in favor of Dennis Hogan. So I thought he won the fight. Um, the judges had it 114-114 a draw. Then 115-113 and 116-112 respectively to... Jaime Munguia. Dennis Hogan says that he was robbed. His team say that he was robbed. I've seen a lot of boxing fans on various different forums and social media saying Dennis Hogan was robbed. Let me know what you guys think. What were your scorecards? I'm not so quick to throw the word robbery around as a lot of other boxing fans are because I've seen real robberies. I've seen fights where one guy gets beaten from pillar to post and yet somehow gets the decision. I've seen fights like that. This was not one of those fights. Munguia did not get beaten from pillar to post. This was a competitive fight. But it was a fight where, again, on my scorecard, I had Dennis Hogan winning. I thought he won by three rounds. Uh, I scored one of the rounds even because it was so difficult to split them. And I know judges don't like uh, scoring even rounds, which is why I tried as much as I could not to score even rounds, but I did have to score one even because I just literally couldn't split them. And I didn't want to give it one way or the other. Um, but the first two thirds of the fight was so competitive. It was so back and forth. There was some, so many of the rounds that were so nip, nip and tuck. You could have had a very different scorecard to another person through the first 
you know, seven, eight rounds. And apparently the judges only agreed on six of the 12. And I can believe that because it was, you know, you, you pick whoever you like in a particular round because they were that close. So I can accept the judges only agreeing on six of the 12 rounds. Um, but do I think Hogan was hard done by to not get the decision? Yeah, yeah. But I, it's not the worst decision I've ever seen in my life. I thought Hogan won. But as I say, he didn't beat the crap out of Jaime Munguia and, you know, beat him from pillar to post. No, he, he, was, he was in a very, very tough fight. I thought he landed the better quality shots overall. Um, you know, more high quality shots overall. But at the end of the day, he did box quite a negative fight sticking and moving and some judges like that other judges don't and it's like the old adage when you're fighting a champion in his backyard you really have to rip the title from the champion you can't try to go there and you know hip hit and hop it and move around and stuff like that sometimes you'll get the benefit of the doubt using those kind of tactics but a lot of judges particularly when you're dealing with a young uh, up and coming star fighting in his home country like Mungia, a lot of judges are going to feel like, you know what? Nah, you're not coming over here to try and steal a decision. If you want to win the fight, beat the guy up, <laughs> you know, show us that you're here to actually take this title from the guy rather than just try, you know, land a few little cute counters here and there and hit and hop it. So again, I feel like Hogan won. And I can understand why he's aggrieved. He obviously worked extremely hard. He was in remarkable condition to be moving like that for his, you know, for the whole 12 rounds, pretty much. Mungia was in great shape too. They're both in tremendous condition. It's really incredible the kind of uh, shape that these professional fighters get themselves into. I mean, both guys, junior welterweights, 154, but I'm sure they were both over 170 pounds in the ring. And to be moving around like that, you know, particularly for Hogan for 12 rounds, that's remarkable. <laughs> that's remarkable physical uh, physical fitness. So, yeah, I can understand why Hogan is aggrieved, but it's not the worst decision, decision I've ever seen. It was a highly competitive fight, a tough fight. And apparently, Mungir and his team have agreed to run it back. They've agreed to give Hogan a rematch. So, we'll see if that happens and if it will go a different way. I'm sure Hogan, if he can, will get the fight in maybe a different part of the world outside of Mexico. It all depends on it, whether the WBO uh, decide to order the fight, right? Because if it's just another voluntary for Munguia, then he's probably going to have it in Mexico again. But if the WBO order it, then there might be a possibility, might, that it could take place in a different country, maybe in the United States or wherever. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Was Paul Hogan robbed? Did you watch the fight? If you did, how did you score it? And, you know, I've seen some people say that Jaime Munguia is regressing because his last few fights, people were not impressed by the performances. I remember the, the fight against the Japanese guy. That was actually a really uh, fun fight. <laughs> Japanese guy is crazy. He came in there looking like Tom Po. You know Tom Po from uh, uh, them old school Kung Fu movies? Yeah, kind of came in there looking like Tom Po. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, I don't think Monkey is necessarily regressing. I just think that we're finding out more about him because, you know, uh, fighters are going to watch Mungia and study him and say okay let me try this tactic nobody's tried this yet let me try this or let me try that that's what people are going to do so I think he's a young kid he's learning and he's still in his development stages even though he's had 33 fights you know these Mexican fighters don't tend to have a lot of amateur fights so they really learn on the job as pros and that's what Mungia is doing he is a world champion and I'd definitely like to see him in there uh, against the other champions at 154, although he has been saying that he may move up to middleweight in the very near future because he, he says it's getting increasingly difficult to make 154. He's obviously a big guy, six feet tall, 
154 pounds. And, you know, at only 22 years old, it's obvious that he's still growing and, and filling out. And you can imagine that it will be, you know, very difficult for him to make 154 for too much longer. So we'll see what happens. I personally like Jaime Munguia. I like his enthusiasm. I like his energy. Yes, he's limited, but hey, boxing is a an entertainment sport. And Jaime Munguia entertains me when he fights. I think his fights are always fun. Um, there's vulnerability there, of course. There's limitations there. But all fighters have vulnerabilities. All fighters have limitations. It's who can implement their game plan, uh, who can exploit the other guy's weaknesses on the night. That's what boxing is all about. So, yeah, drop your comments in the comment section below. Let me know how you felt about Jaime Munguia versus Dennis Hogan. It's happening, I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week covering a wide variety of controversial topics as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.